It's good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see everyone here. Good to see everyone here. Did you have a good week? I know I did. A lot going on. Thank you so much for bringing up that, that flip chart. Oh, I forgot. Oh, I have my, my marker here. Thank you so much. We're starting a new mini-series this week. Two weeks. What's the title? Adapt or Expire. Embracing Change to Fulfill Your Mission. Adapt or Expire. Adapt or Expire. Embracing Change to Fulfill Your Mission. Why are we, why are we even in this, this, uh, this series? Well, we want to learn how to thrive in our relationships and our mission. Look, I don't know what your mission is. We have people in various life stages. Uh, I remember those of you who are married, raise your hand if you're married. All right? Raise your hand if it was easy in the first year of marriage to adjust and adapt to marriage. Okay, good, good on you. We had one hand here. <laughs> All right? Uh, you have to adapt in order to thrive, right? You have to adapt to order to th- in order to thrive. We have some parents here. I remember my first child had no idea how to change a diaper. No idea. And right when Eliana came out, I'm going to have to learn how to change a diaper. And thank God I know how to change a diaper. I adapted in order to thrive. What about work? Those of you who, who work, First, first job, second job, third job, you want to grow and, and, and continue to serve in your work, you have to adapt. School. I know we have some students uh, finishing eighth grade, senior, going to, into college. We have to adapt in order to thrive. In every transition in life, we have to adapt in order to thrive. When you're a baby, you have to adapt in order to thrive. Then you, become, you, you, uh, you grow into a toddler, adapt in order to, to thrive. Right? Elementary school, adapt. Middle school, adapt. High school, adapt. College, adapt. First job, you got to adapt. Get married, you have to adapt. You have children, you have to adapt. You have teenagers, you have to adapt. You're a grandparent, you have to adapt. We have to adapt in order, in order to thrive. We know that. But you know, let me spend some moments here speaking about church in general speaking about Christianity, I'm in graduate school right now, thinking a lot about how does the church, how do believers adapt to this culture? Uh, Pew Research put out um, an article, I think it was about two years ago, uh, tracking the amount of religious nuns, those who are disaffiliated from religion. About 10 years ago, the number was about 20%. Right now, uh, the numbers are climbing. It's about 30%, and I I tracked it here in the Hinsdale area, about 30% of of the the, uh, population here are religiously disaffiliated. And I wonder to myself, as a believer, how how can we adapt to uh, a culture that is becoming increasingly secular and is... Uh, allergic to and sometimes even hostile to faith, to Christianity. And I ask these questions a lot. I think about this a lot. And some might be thinking, oh, come on, Nestor, no way. Adapt? Uh, I'm never going to change. I'm never going to change. Well, I will say this, that there are many of you, there are many here who emigrated from another country. Some even emigrated, you, you were born here and your parents emigrated from another country. Many of us here already know how to adapt. We have adapted to thrive in the United States of America, in a different culture, a different country. And so what we're going to do, what we're going to do today as we study, uh, as we learn about adapting so that we can embrace change to fulfill our mission, we're going to uh, have two teachings. Today's teaching is entitled, Seek First to Understand. And then next week, uh, the title is, Now Be Understood. I, I borrowed this phrase from... Uh, have you heard of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey? He, uh, habit number four, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And I, 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 borrowed, it, I borrowed it from Stephen Covey. Today, we're going to learn how, how to seek first to understand. And what we're going to do is we're going to be in the book of Acts. Acts is 
uh, in the New Testament. It's the fifth book of the New Testament. I'd like you to turn with me there. Uh, if you have your Bible, if you have a digital Bible, that's okay, your phone, your tablet. We're going to go to the book of Acts to see how Paul, the Apostle Paul, adapted to a very, a very uh, non-believing culture, all right? Because we live in a culture that is religiously disaffiliated. And we're going to see parallels between uh, our world today, our, our, our world today, and the world that Paul was trying to reach. So we're in Acts chapter 17, and I'm going to begin with verse 16, okay? So we're going to be mostly in Acts chapter 17, now in verse 16. Here we go. We're going to learn three principles of how to adapt, how to seek to understand. Here's the first principle. Verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens. Has anyone been to Athens before? Athens, Greece? Anyone? Uh, I was there in 2007. I finished my last undergraduate class in, in biblical Greek in Greece. It was amazing. Uh, our, our classroom was... Uh, a classroom on top of a hotel, all glass classroom that overlooked the Aegean Sea. It was fascinating. So I, I, I and I saw, I saw what, what some of the things that, that Paul had seen. You see, Paul, who was Paul anyway? Paul was a, a Greek-speaking Jew. His name was Saul. His name was later changed to Paul. He was from Tarsus. He was this very, um, uh, very uh, strict Jew. And to make a long story short, he was changed and he became a believer in the Messiah and a believer in Yahweh and in Jesus Christ. He was on his second missionary tour. And his second missionary tour, he started off in this place called Antioch. And he traveled uh, mostly by foot, right, um, all the way to, to Athens. Now, I tracked it on the map uh, it would be southern Turkey. Southern Turkey to Athens, Greece was about 1,300 miles. And that's, about, that's like uh, traveling from here, Chicago, down to Corpus Christi, southern Texas, about 1,290 miles. Do you know how long it took him to travel? If you travel it by, by foot, I went on Google Maps and, and, and tracked how, many, how long it would take to travel by foot. Uh, it takes about 431 hours or 18 days. Why, Paul, why is Paul doing this? Well, something is compelling him to share about the Messiah. So he travels from Antioch, and he comes to the northwest to a place called Berea in Acts chapter 16. And there in Berea, he, he meets people who, who, uh, who study the word, who study the Bible. They're really strong believers. And then he's with Silas and, Silas and Timothy, and uh, he says, hey, guys, um, you want to go down to Athens? Hey, we're going to stay back. So Silas and Timothy stay back in Berea. Then he travels all the way down to Athens, Greece. He's by himself. So here's Paul in a new culture. He's never been to a culture, a culture like this before. And notice what the Bible says in verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Wow. There are a plethora of of temples and images of pagan deities. I had seen the, uh, the Parthenon in, in Athens, Greece, this amazing temple, magnificent temple that was built for the goddess, goddess Athena. Paul is bothered to see every, that every square inch was covered with idols that represented artificial gods. You know, I was in Indonesia uh, several years ago. You know what covers almost every square inch of Indonesia? mosquitoes. You guys been to a tropical country? They're everywhere. Philippines, they're everywhere. Everywhere you go, you're watching for these mosquitoes, right? Like I would go into a room, every square inch was covered with a mosquito. They would wait. I, I really believe that they would wait at the, the corner of the door or the edge of the door. Right when I opened, they would, they would enter the, the bathroom of the room. Everywhere I went, I would see these mosquitoes and they would just eat me up. They loved my, they loved my American blood, I guess. They're everywhere. These gods are everywhere. And, they were, and, and these mosquitoes um, caused Paul to be provoked. The word provoked means agitated. And Paul is agitated that these idols are biting his belief system. He's a believer in the one true God. And everywhere he goes, he's seeing, uh, he's seeing these, these idols to these artificial gods. But check this out. Despite his agitation... 
Look at what he does. Now, some of us, you know, we get agitated when, some, when people believe differently from us. They have a, maybe a different political persuasion. Or maybe, maybe they have a different uh, belief system altogether. Look what Paul does despite his agitation. Verse 17 says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. You know what the word reason means? The word reason means to engage in dialogue. And despite his agitation, Paul is still able to reason and engage in dialogue. So principle number one, rule your agitation. Rule your agitation. There was a Holocaust survivor by the name of Viktor Frankl, and he had said this in one of his books. He said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our, our freedom. Let me illustrate to you uh, what he meant by that. So between, right, between, um, he called it stimulus and response. Sorry, I hope you can read my, that's an R, okay? He said between stimulus and response, uh, there's a choice, okay? Uh, he didn't add this, but I, I want to add this here. So right between, right between stimulus and response is what we call feeling, okay? What, what, what's up with Viktor Frankl? Why did he say this? As he was being tortured... And as family members were, and friends were being tortured in the concentration camps, he had a choice. I'm experiencing the stimuli, sti the stimuli right, of uh, being tortured. And I am feeling agitated and uh, uh, angry, probably revengeful. But he said between stimulus and response is a choice. And what happens here is the difference between failure and success, between our growth or our decay. Paul experiences a stimulus. What does he see? He sees idols, right? And what was the accompanying feeling? He was agitated, right? But instead of throwing a fit and say, oh, shame on you, right, and calling these people out, what does he do? His response is, he reasons with the people. He actually engages in conversation with people. Between our stimulus and response is a choice. And friends, you and I know that if we, do not rule, if we don't rule our agitation, it's the difference between failure and success. Example, some of us who are married, let's say Jack and Jill had a, a marriage. They were, they, were, they were married for nine years, all right, or eight years. They were married for eight years. And they're just, not, they're just not connecting, right? And, and, and Jill is like, come on, Jack, you don't, you don't spend time with me, or you don't, we don't spend time together. Well, uh, Jill, you, you got to understand, I'm so busy. I'm so busy at work, right? And they just get into this really awkward spiral in their marriage. And then she begins to complain more and more and more. He realizes, Jack realizes, like, if I, something needs to change here. And Jack chooses... As he's receiving these feelings of, of uh, uh, bitterness and sadness and, and grief in the marriage, he doesn't want to lose the marriage. And he makes a choice that instead of trying to call out his wife and say, what is wrong with you, Jill? He says, Jill, I understand that we're not, paying, we're not spending time together. I really want to try to understand, I want to understand how you feel. Or in the heat of the moment, in the heat of an argument, he, he says, you know what, right now, right now I am feeling really agitated and I cannot even, I can't, I want to be able to reason with you. And so Jill, what I'm going to do right now is take a time out because I love the relationship so much that I'm going to take a time out so that we can reason together instead of failing our, our marriage. Does this make sense? Principle number one from Paul is that we rule our agitation. And between the stimulus and the feeling of agitation that we have, there's a choice. And sometimes that means 
I imagine Paul taking a break and saying, you know, I, I just, this is really hard for me to see all these idols, but I'm going to take a break. And yet, he's still able to enter into that season of, or ent- enter into conversation with, with people. Make sense? All right. So, principle number one, rule your agitation. And friends, uh, you might be agitated by people on the other side of your political views. You might be agitated by, by people who, who, don't, who don't believe the same way you do. I had every reason to become agitated when I was in a conversation with someone in Colorado who had grown up in a church who became, who started believing in uh, Eastern mysticism. And I had every reason, but you know what? I kept my cool, I ruled my agitation, and I was able to reason, reason with her about the faith. Principle number one, rule your agitation. Number two, here we go, verse 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 17. We read this already. So we reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. And then look at verse 18. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Who are these people? Let me, let me just let me draw, this on, draw this for y'all. So you have on one end, all right, let's just draw a straight, straight line here. All right. Who are the people that, that Paul is interacting with here? Well, first, he, um, he's interacting with what we call, uh, I'm calling it MT, monotheists, right? These are the, uh, the Jews and the, um, he calls them the devout persons, or Luke does. These are the Gentiles. These are the people who believe, who are monotheists, meaning they believe in one God, all right? What was their vision? Their vision was the law or the Old Testament, okay, for them. And then he says in verse 18 that he meets these Epicurean and these Stoic philosophers, okay? We'll call them uh, non-monotheists, okay? You guys catching what I'm writing here? I'm explaining to you because you might not be able to read my handwriting. And there are two types of people. There are two types of philosophers. Who's the first? The Epicureans, okay? What were the Epicureans? What did they believe? These, uh, these Epicureans uh, were what we call like secular agnostics, right? So, so they believed that there could be a God, but they were more like deists, okay? You know what a deist is? A deist is someone who, uh, who says, you know what, God created this world, but he's completely detached from, from, from the world, okay? And then you have the Stoics. And what did the Stoics believe? They uh, believed in some Eastern mysticism, but they prized reason, okay? They prized reason. There might be a God, there might be a God who, who exists, but he's not really involved. That's a deist, the Epicureans, the Stoics. There could be gods, but we prize reason, we prize thinking. Pew Research put an article out, I mentioned this, studying religious nuns in our culture today. And religious nuns are those who identify as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. You know what they're saying? They're saying that the, uh, right now the number is about 30% in our culture, and in about 50 years, by year 2070, uh, they're saying that it could reach as high as 50%, five zero. And friends, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, these people around us who don't, who don't have faith, there are people who have grown up within the Christian tradition, even within this church, who we call the de-churched, who are not even engaged in church. This is a reality and a big problem, especially for those within the Christian persuasion. What does Paul do? Does, does, does the text say that Paul bashes all of the Epicureans and the Stoics and the Jews and the Gentiles? No. He reasons with them. Principle number one, we learn, rule your agitation. Principle number two, understand them. Who's them? Those who hold opposing belief to yours. Now, question, can this community, this community of faith, Hinsdale Philam Church, be a place where they feel accepted and understood? 
Could this be a place where people, people who are different from us, who believe differently, who look different from us, can, can feel safe and, 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 and accepted? Now, I'm not saying that we have to abandon our beliefs when we engage with people who hold opposing views. But someone might ask Nestor, is it possible to hold to my convictions without being contaminated? Is that even possible? And my answer, my answer to you is unabashedly, unequivocally, yes. The best example of this was Jesus himself. He never abandoned his convictions, but he, was, he still engaged with them. Now question, who labeled them them anyway? These categories of us and them, who labeled them anyway? It was the religious leaders who looked down on Jesus and said, how dare you hang out with them, those tax collectors and sinners? What's the point? The point is that the doctrinal guardians, the doctrinal guardians, those who were so convinced about their beliefs were the most likely to treat them as contaminated. And it's just a warning to me, warning to us that the more we know, the more likely you look down on people who are different from you. But you know, Jesus did not care about those categories. He came to understand us, all of us. He left heaven to come to earth to put himself in our shoes so that he can understand us. And friends, we know that if I, if I don't understand why my kids are acting up, I can put myself in the shoes of my children to understand them. If I don't understand why my, my spouse is frustrated, I can try to do my best to put myself and say, look, I don't really understand, but I understand that you're really hurt and that, that I really frustrated you. If we don't understand why there are, there are uh, religious nuns outside and even inside the church, we can put ourselves in their shoes. Principle number one, rule your agitation. Principle number two, understand them. Last but not least, we'll read verses 18 through 21. Paul says, verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, of the, uh, um, philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? It's a derogatory term. They're calling Paul names. Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. That's all they would do. They would just share stories, share, share these, hey, check, hey, hey, do you hear about that new philosophy or that new idea? That's all they would do. And these philosophers are saying, what are these strange truths that this man Paul is talking about? Because they love new and fascinating ideas. But Paul's truth is more than just an idea, friends. What is it? What was the truth that Paul clung to? The text says in verse 18, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching who? Jesus and the resurrection. Paul's truth was not just an idea, friends. Paul's truth was a person who came, who was resurrected out of the dead. In other words, Paul's truth, his true north, okay, let's just draw a triangle here. Well, let's draw a triangle here. Paul's true north was Jesus in the resurrection. In other words, that is called the gospel. That was his true north. That was his true north. Principle number three, cling to the truth. Cling to it. Hold on to it. Hang on to it for your dear life. What is the truth? The gospel. That's what he held on to. Ah, man. So I was thinking about this. Why does this even matter? Why does this even matter? Earlier in Acts, you read about Paul. You know what his name was before? So I'm going to write it. We're going to write it here. His name, where should I write this? I'll write it right here. 
Saul's name, Saul, Saul, Paul was formerly Saul, okay? Can you guys see that? Saul? Check this out. He had information, right? The Old Testament. And with that information, what was he doing? He was hanging on to what we call ritual, right? This is Saul. He looked at these cockroaches called Christians, and he was trying to kill them and persecute them. He was on his way to Damascus to to maintain the rituals of Judaism. And because of this information and his fidelity to ritual, what did he end up doing to people? He ended up oppressing people and taking them out. And while he was on his way to Damascus, you'll read about this in this, the same book in, in, in Acts. <sighs> He's blinded, right? And he can't see. And to make a long story short, this, this uh, persecutor of Christians, he becomes the very Jesus he's trying to destroy is the very Jesus he begins to, tell, to, to, to start talking about and sharing about. Paul then, Saul is then turned to Paul, and check this out. He had the information of the Bible. God speaks to him, and he says, hey, look, 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 look. Even though you are on your way to kill Christians, I want to pursue you, and I want to have a relationship with you, right? I still want you on my side. And that relationship led to transformation. Here's why it matters. Many of us think, hmm, let me believe, let me just make sure I have all the dogma and the beliefs down. True, true. But it was not ideology that drove, that, dro that fueled dro uh, Saul's or Paul's engine. It was the very person of Jesus who wanted a relationship with him, which led to transformation. And do you know what happened? Do you know what happened to Paul? You're like, look, Pastor, I'm scared of change. I'm scared of adapting. You know why many of us, one writer said, many of us are scared. I'm scared of adapting and change. Because I'm not, scared of, I'm not scared of change, I'm actually scared of loss. And there are many people, myself included, who are nervous about change. And check this out. God comes on the scene. He pursues a relationship with him. And Paul's world is turned upside down because his belief in God was not just based on information. It was based on a relationship of a Jesus who pursued him via the gospel and called him into a relationship with Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And this same Paul was willing to give his life. You know, according to tradition, uh, he was martyred for the faith, and he was, he was even beheaded. And we think to ourselves, I don't want that kind of change. Beheaded, that's, that's crazy. But here is so amazing about the gospel and about Jesus. When I find Jesus, when I find Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, I find everything that my heart is longing for. I find everything that I'm, I'm looking for. And even if I were to risk my life for the sake of this Messiah, that's okay. Because he gives me everything that I need in him. Because he's pursuing a relationship with me. And my question for you, friends, is how do you relate to this Jesus Messiah? Do you relate to him only as a, a doctrine or as a piece of information that you need to know? Or do we actually interact with the Messiah in a relationship because he's the one who's pursuing me and, and, and he gave his life for me, he died for my sin, and he's calling me into this amazing relationship with him which links me into a relationship with Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Like, why, if my heart is longing for to be filled, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking for something, Paul finds it. I find it. Many here have found that. And friend, I want to invite you today 
to not go to God just out of information, but let him come into your life, change you via the gospel, and enter this amazing intimate relationship with the Father, Son, and Jesus Christ. Friend, I used to be here. Actually, I was here. Right? We'll call this irreligion, living apart from God, like the, the first prodigal son. Then I came here, and I became the second prodigal son, which is the older brother, where the law and, per, and, 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 and perfectly following his law to the T became my philosophy of life. There's no joy here apart from the Father, and there's no joy here just using the Father for myself. Meaning, I keep his commandments so that I can gain his approval. Jesus comes to, this, to this, this guy named Paul. And he says, look, you're here taking people out. Information committed to ritual and Judaism. Now you're taking people out. I want to share with you that it is, not, it is not this position that's going to give you joy, Paul. It's a relationship with me given freely by what Jesus has done for you. And so, friend, for by grace you have been saved through faith. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You get into this relationship with him, it changes your life forever. I promise you. Our praise team is going to come up. We're going to sing this song. Go light your world. Because what we want to share with the world is not just the light of our tradition, but the light of Jesus with this foreign world. The light of this Jesus who loves us so much that he gave his life for us. Let's sing together as our praise team leads us in this song. Go light your world. Let's stand together.